Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to your new CPD series from the Recover Compensate Network. I'm Rosie Brown, and I'm the network's membership manager. And today I am delighted to be joined by Debbie Brown, industrial disease partners, you in love, and Gary Ross for our spotlight on asbestos related claims. Before I pass over to both you and Gary to get today started, just a few bits of housekeeping from myself. Today's session will end at approximately 2 p.m. and we'll conclude with a short Q&A. So if you do have any questions throughout today's session, feel free to pop these into the Q&A box mm. or the chat box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. The webinar will also be available for download and we will send that out once today's session has finished. So thank you. That is everything from me. So I will now happily pass across to you and Gary to get today started. So thank you. Hi, Rosie. Uh, no, thanks very much for that. And thank you for everyone who's attending. Um, as Rosie's saying, you should take around about one hour or so of your time um, over lunch, so I um, won't keep you too long. Um, so I'm Ewan Love. I'm one of the partners in the industrial disease team. And that is a list of the pictures of all the people that are in the industrial disease team in Digby Brown. So there are nine of us at the moment, um, and it is an expanding team. Um, myself, uh, at the bottom left of that picture, and Gary Ross, who's in this top, uh, bottom right, um, are the partners. Fraser Simpson, second from right in the top, um, is the head of department at the moment, but retiring in a couple of weeks, and I'll be taking over that position. So um, we are the, the ones that are responsible for all the complicated long tail uh, disease cases. Um, so today we're going to be primarily talking about the asbestos related diseases and that makes up the vast vast majority of work types that we do as a department but we really deal with any um long tail disease claim and this was the definition of a disease claim is a claim that involves an injury that is not as a result of one individual incident it's a sequence of events that have led to the the disease occurring and asbestos being the prime example of exposure to asbestos over a number of years resulting in the asbestos-related diseases. Um, so they make up the majority of the cases that our department deal with, but um, we do deal with other ones, silicosis, uh, which is as a result a lung condition caused by exposure to silica dust. Um, and we're seeing more of those types of cases at the moment. Um, they're a really big deal in Australia at the moment where there's screening of stonemasons and they're seeing a lot of individuals with that condition. And we're starting to see more of those in Scotland, but it's really quite underdiagnosed dermatitis cases. We see a few of those, people coming into contact with chemicals at work normally. So you get cleaners or people working in heavy industry around oils um, will get dermatitis. So we have a few of those cases. Occupational asthma cases, um, they're quite tricky, but we are able to piece them together if there's a really good uh, peak flow diet that, that the individual has connecting the um, exacerbations of asthma to the workplace uh, and the substance that they were coming into contact with. Finally, legionnaires, uh, so people coming into contact with legionella in stagnant water, so hot tubs, um, shower heads, we do some of those cases, but the vast majority of the cases that we deal with um, are asbestos related disease cases, and that's um, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I'll pass over to Gary, who I think is going to explain a bit about just the beginning, which is what is and um, what is asbestos. Good everyone. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to cover a couple of basics and then a little bit of background on what is asbestos. So I apologise if I am teaching anyone's going to suck eggs, but um, there is a, an element of, of uh, complexity involved with asbestos, the actual fibre itself. So in front of you just now are the six types of asbestos fibres that have been mined and used over, well, since the past uh, 100 years or so, since it began mining in the late 19th century. The main ones that our clients are exposed to are the ones on that top line. So um, chrysidolite, amosite and chrysotile. And between the three of them, um, they are broken down into two different groups. So amosite and chrysidolite are known as amphibole materials. Um, and that's due to the nature of the shape. They're long, straight, uh, and needle-like. Uh, and then chrysotile uh, is known as a serpentine. So it's a curved uh, and slightly more flexible um, fiber. Quite often we'll have clients when they're discussing their, their exposure, um, identify uh, materials, products through color. So quite a lot of clients will say 
we use a lot of blue asbestos or brown asbestos. Um, the blue asbestos is chrysidolite, which you could probably see just from the image itself there, has a, a blue tint to it. Um, and unfortunately, it is the most uh, potent in terms of being a carcinogen and increasing the, the, the risks that a cancer might, might occur. Um, and that's because it's very fine and sharp and unfortunately can get into the deep tissues of, of the lung. Quite often clients will say they use brown asbestos and that is amosite, which again you can see just slight um, brown coloration with, with the fibre there. Um, amosite used again a lot of insulation materials, um, asbestos ceiling tiles, uh, but most common um, is chrysotile, which is always described as, as the white white asbestos by clients. And that was very, very commonly used in a, in a variety of products um, because of its more flexible um, qualities, asbestos fire blankets, gloves, asbestos insulation boards, which is found throughout both domestic and uh, commercial premises. So those are the three main types of fibres that our clients typically come into contact with. And asbestos, um, is, as you can imagine, sadly, has got a very, very long history of usage um, uh, and, and not just heavy industry, but some things that you might not expect either. So there's a very um, infamous example um, of asbestos being used as a prop on the set of The Wizard of Oz as snow. Um, and in the 50s as well, someone thought it was a good idea to put chrysidolite um, in the filters of cigarettes. So Kent uh, cigarettes um, made those for many years. So it's um, widely, widely used and even further still, to keep in with a Hollywood theme, um, people may know about the famous example, sadly, of, of Steve McQueen, who died as a result of mesothelioma, which you will talk about a bit more. Um, and I actually found out, whilst preparing for this, that the um, uh, Paul Gleason, who played the principal in The Breakfast Club, also died of mesothelioma. Both gentlemen were involved in construction earlier in their, their working lives before they moved into to acting and whatever else they got into. So um, it's got a very wide sweeping um, sad history as asbestos and today um, just to try and illustrate where you might find it even to this day um, it can be really found all throughout any sort of domestic premise so if you live in a house um, or, or, or it was built in a certain era so for example after the war through the 50s 60s 70s and possibly into the early 80s although it did begin to be phased out, um, asbestos was used uh, for a number of products. So we'll have um, a lot of clients who may have been cutting up asbestos sheeting um, for various uses around the home, anywhere essentially where you have to fireproof uh, a particular area, whether it's behind a cooker or a fireplace, a lot of the time asbestos was the go-to material in order to fireproof that. And even on the outside of the building, in soffits and, and you've seen downpipes and things, we've got a lot of clients who have been smashing those up and cutting them on site, inside houses and things. So it was widely, widely used um, in, in the construction of houses. Um, and you know there are thousands upon thousands of buildings, even to this day, that still have asbestos um, present within them. So I'll come to you now to carry on with the uh, diseases. Yeah, so, so obviously what we want to focus on uh, after that introduction is what are the conditions that we are seeking compensation for? What are the asbestos-related conditions? And I thought to start by discussing just the scale of the problem as it presently stands, because when you speak to people, I think there's a bit of an assumption that the, the issue of asbestos disease is coming to an end. We're, kind of, we're through the worst of that. And it's 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 drawn to an end because it's associated with very heavy industry, which Gary will come on to in terms of shipyards. Um, and with the passage of time, you'd expect these cases to die out. And interestingly, the health and safety executive they produce statistics every year of the number of asbestos-related deaths in the UK. And they've been doing this for 15, 20 years, and they've always been moving forward the dates at which they predict the peak of the number of deaths to be. And I think we're probably at that peak at the moment. Um, but it took you know, 15, 20, 25 years to reach that peak. So there will be coming down the other side of it. So I suspect we're close to the peak at the moment in terms of the number of people being affected by the asbestos diseases. But there's a, a long way to go until um, you know, people um, are not suffering the effects of it. And one of the issues that 
Gary will come on to is that people are now living in buildings, working in buildings that contain asbestos. So it's it's going to continue for some time yet. <laughs> and there are the estimate is that there's five thousand deaths in the UK per year as a result of asbestos related disease. Um, and that's more than there are um, fatalities on the roads. And um, so it's a huge, huge problem. These deaths are really split between two of the asbestos related diseases that will come come on to um, the malignant ones, which are mesothelioma and asbestos related lung cancer. So those two, and it's meant to be a ratio of one to one, there's 2,500 deaths caused by mesothelioma, and they're pretty sure, but 2,500 are caused by um, uh, so it's 2,500 for mesothelioma, 2,500 for the, the asbestos related lung cancer, although it's more difficult to attribute the lung cancer um, to asbestos exposure. But those are the numbers that we're talking about. And it is old evidence. Um, it's a minimum of 15 years after exposure to asbestos that someone will go on to develop an asbestos related condition. So we do get people calling us up saying, um, you know, I was at work yesterday and I came into contact with asbestos. What should I do? In terms of pursuing a claim, nothing, because in the unlikely event anything does happen, it won't be for another 15 or 20 years. So all we would advise it is that they also notify the HSE um, and have it noted in the GP records as that if in the event they want to develop something in the future, that would assist us. Um, but first of all, focusing on the non-malignant conditions, and it is generally, a, it's a condition of the lung, um, a specialist related disease primarily. And it happens because people are inhaling asbestos fibers into their lungs, get stuck in their lungs, and they sit there for decades and decades, and eventually something happens. And it's not quite terribly well understood, but something happens and they develop one of the asbestos related conditions. And the least harmful of all of them is pleural plaques. And that is a scar on the lungs caused by asbestos exposure. And it's really the lung encasing the asbestos fibers. And it's picked up on CT scans and X-rays. And it's usually as an incidental finding. What we see typically in the medical records is the client attending the GP complaining of breathlessness or a persistent cough. They go for a CT scan or X-ray and it's picked up as an incidental finding. Um, and they're told about it being asbestos related. And they are then the, the compensation um, kind of process is put in, in train for them um, and they're able to seek compensation for that. But pleural plaques in themselves, they cause no breathlessness, they cause no symptoms whatsoever. And this was a point that was argued by insurers in England that you shouldn't actually receive compensation for pleural plaques because they do cause no symptoms. And in the case of Rothwell against um, Chemical Insulating Company, the insurers were successful in that argument in the House of Lords. So pleural plaques are not compensatable in England and Wales because they cause no symptoms. They're not an injury. But the Scottish Parliament thankfully reversed that, um, that decision with the damages, especially related to conditions in Scotland Act 2009. And it's a very simple, very brief act uh, that simply said that um, pleural plaques constitute an actionable harm for the purposes of an action for damages for personal injuries. So it is possible to pursue a claim for pleural plaques in Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland. Their assembly followed the Scottish Parliament, uh, Parliament's lead in terms of uh, enacting the same analogous legislation there. So you can recover compensation for plaques in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but not England um, or Wales. Um, moving on to a couple of the other um, non-malignant conditions that we see, uh, one of which is asbestosis. And the clients often get the terminology a bit confused when they come to us. They're not quite sure what they've been diagnosed with. They might call it, I've got the asbestos, or often it's called asbestosis. But it's a label that is handed out a bit too quickly um, by some doctors. Um, so asbestosis is pulmonary fibrosis, which is a scarring of the lung tissue. It's a fibrosis of the lung. So fibrosis of the lung can be caused by many things or uh, idiopathic with no known cause. The doctors are able to label it as asbestosis, so caused by asbestos, if there's a really clear history of quite heavy exposure to asbestos over a number of years. So pulmonary fibrosis is simply labelled as asbestosis when it's really heavy exposure. But doctors are quite quick to tell individuals they have asbestosis on the merest mention of asbestos exposure when, strictly speaking, they really need to have a heavier exposure than that for it to be properly labelled as such. Um, so asbestosis does cause a breathing disability. It tends to be fairly slow progressing, but you do have cases where people become very disabled, dependent on oxygen, 
and it can shorten um, their life. And there, there is no cure for it. Um, it's purely treating the symptoms by way of oxygen, but it can be very, very disabling. Um, the, the final uh, non-malignant condition is pleural thickening, um, also known as diffuse pleural thickening. And again, this is extensive scarring, uh, which thickens the pleura, which is a thin membrane that covers the lung. In terms of value, these cases are similar to asbestosis, and it's dependent on the percentage of respiratory disability that the individual suffers. Um, so it can cause chest pain, um, and it can also cause pretty severe breathing problems. So we see some clients with no disability, with asbestosis and pleural thickening, with no breathing problems at all, up to 60-70% respiratory disability, which means you're, you're stuck in a chair. Um, so they can be pretty nasty conditions, but the majority of them are not too bad, and certainly not as bad as the um, the malignant conditions that I'll now come on to. Um, the main one is mesothelioma, and it's a really, really horrible cancer um, that is caused only by exposure to asbestos. Um, it's primarily of the lungs, the vast, vast majority of individuals with mesothelioma, it's of the lining of the lung, and mesothelial cells develop there. So the vast majority of cases um, are lung related, and it's a horrible cancer with um, a very short life expectancy. Um, most individuals don't live beyond one year. We have some clients living a matter of months or weeks. Um, you do get the occasional client who lives um, for four or five or six years, but that is the exception. It's a really, it's a nasty condition. And it's usually picked up initially by breathlessness, which is caused by a buildup of fluid in the lung. <clears throat> so the individual can have a chest strain put in to drain, to drain out the chest fluid but it comes back and it eventually gets worse and worse um, until almost invariably they, they, they pass away as a result of it. There are treatments. Um, so people receive chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and more recently, um, immunotherapy was approved for uh, use in the NHS in Scotland and in England. Um, but they, um, they simply try and control the speed of the progress of the disease and they don't reverse it. So it's a matter of putting the brakes on a bit, but there is invariably um, a fatal condition. Um, they have tried operations. Um, there's been trials, and recently there was a, a big trial in terms of, can we take this out, can we get rid of it? But the outcomes for the individuals, and I've heard some horror stories, the outcomes of the individuals who had the surgery is worse than the individuals who they just they left it alone. So now they don't really do any surgery for that. Um, especially related to lung cancer, so this, the, the Health and Safety Executive think there should be a ratio of one to one for mesothelioma to asbestos-related lung cancer cases. So there should be as many, well, as many people die from asbestos-related lung cancer as they do from mesothelioma. But we see that the proportion is very different to that that we see. Um, I'd say probably 10 to one in favor of mesothelioma. And the reason for that is that the medical profession don't always ask the question about asbestos exposure. So if someone has lung cancer, they will be invariably they asked about smoking history. And if they um, say as that positive that they were a smoker, then that is what it will be attributed to within the NHS database. And it will be a smoking related um, cancer of the lung. However, um, it can be caused by asbestos as well. So they need to be asking questions about um, asbestos exposure. It takes very heavy exposure. It's a bit like asbestosis. The doctors to attribute a lung cancer to asbestos exposure, you need really heavy exposure over a number of years. And it's calculated a bit like um, pack years for smokers. You do a calculation to work out their cumulative exposure. And if you get above a certain threshold, the doctors are happy to link that lung cancer to um, asbestos exposure. And going back briefly to uh, mesothelioma, so it's primarily of the lungs. We are seeing quite a few peritoneal, which is the stomach, peritoneal mesothelioma cases, particularly in women. So we're seeing more of those. And we've had one case of uh, an individual who had testicular mesothelioma. And the doctors aren't able to fully explain exactly how it's linked to asbestos exposure, but they all do make that link um, to asbestos exposure. So those are the conditions that, um, that we are pursuing the claims or, um, and I'll pass you back to Gary, who's going to explain the types of exposure that people have had um, that have resulted in them developing these conditions. So the, the types of cases that, that we have seen, um, which like has shifted over the years, 
So we have to adapt in response to that. But going back to the the initial, what we call the first wave of, of victims of asbestos exposure, um, it goes back to that late 19th century, turn of the century, when those first workers were mining asbestos um, at the coal face, um, being exposed to obscenely high levels. Um, and quickly thereafter, you had a number of individuals who would be working inside asbestos factories, taking those raw fibres and then manipulating them and um, weaving them into various products and materials that, that were then sold and used throughout industry. So what you find that first wave is, say, the miners, uh, and then all the workers um, at Kitson's Insulation, Turner & Newell's, Glenno Asbestos, and I'll mention Cape as well, who are one of the, the big big uh, perpetrators of, of a lot of asbestos um, deaths throughout the, the UK, who are now known as Altrad, and uh, any rugby fans will probably recognise that name because they sponsor the French rugby team. Um, so, yeah, certainly a, a dark history to, to Altrad. And then as you move forward through the decades, you see a slight change in the, the type of exposure, and it then becomes the construction workers, shipyard workers, rail workers, um, power station workers, which all of these types of cases still form a, a huge part of the work that we carry out today. So a few weeks ago, I actually had a, a court of session proof start for uh, an asbestosis uh, case. Um, the chap worked in power stations throughout the UK. Um, and you can, even to this point, we are still facing a lot of arguments for things that you'd think would have been accepted. Um, but unfortunately, we still have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing defenders even up to, to the point of proof. Um, and it just goes to show really um, that employers, although, which you and will cover in a second, the knowledge of the dangers of asbestos began to increase, spread, they didn't take any steps to safeguard or protect their employees. And as you move forward again through the decades, the complexion of the cases again change. And this is perhaps becoming more difficult and, and slightly more um, nuanced in terms of, of the type of exposure. It's not traditional in, in the way that we've seen previously. Um, it has involved, for example, people working in nurseries, schools, with its school cleaners, academics and doctors, all developing mesothelioma, and they have no identifiable source of, of, of a, an occupation that would put them in the firing line to asbestos exposure, but it may have been the case that they may have worked in a building, a hospital or a school that might have been undergoing refurbishment work. So their exposure could be incidental. It could be a case of simply walking through an area uh, which wasn't cordoned off, wasn't sealed properly, and over the course of a couple of weeks, they may have an exposure. We've had school cleaners who their, their exposure was um, sweeping up uh, damaged asbestos tiles, which had fallen during uh, periods of bad weather. And it's as simple as just spending a couple of days sweeping up uh, uh, broken asbestos tiles. So the, the new type of cases are becoming a little bit more different. Um, and because of that, as I say, we have to be alert to all possible avenues of exposure. And I thought I would highlight the, um, well, what's happened in the past couple of years, and, and probably some of you may or may not have heard about this, um, but there's been some stories in the news um, about um, contaminated talc, and talc and powder. So um, in the UK, we will talk about talc as talc and powder, and you instantly think of baby powder, Johnson & Johnson. However, talc, um, like asbestos is a mineral which um, has to be extracted from the earth and is mined um, and unfortunately the talc which has been mined um, has veins of asbestos running through it and then when that talc is then taken and ground down into a powder to then be used in various makeup products and body powders, foot powders, talc and powders across, across the globe um, then you find that people have been exposed through that means as well. And uh, over the past couple of years, we have seen an increase in female mesothelioma sufferers, uh, and, and certainly stepping away from what I would call the traditional female cases, which is um, wives shaking out their husband's overalls when they get back from work. Um, now it's a case of there is no uh, identifiable identifiable source of exposure or nothing that's immediately apparent um, 
there's nothing to do with occupation and then you have to consider well have they used any particular products which have been contaminated with talc and on the right hand side there is my client laura um laura and i um did an article with the sunday times uh, a few months back and unfortunately laura who's 34 now um developed peritoneal mesothelioma um, and I met with Laura, we went through every possible source of exposure she may have had from, from the family background to where she grew up. And um, it turns out, unfortunately, she'd used uh, an array of products, all of which um, were contaminated with um, asbestos. So uh, her case is ongoing and she is one of a number of uh, female clients that we have referred to uh, a firm we're working closely with in the US and they are pursuing cases and they are uh, achieving successful results. So it helps us um, to pursue uh, cases that um, there may not be an obvious defender here in the UK. And I very lastly just on this point highlight Johnson & Johnson because here in the UK, they're probably the most uh, infamous example of, of the contaminated talc uh, issue. Um, in the US, they've attempted to go into bankruptcy twice. Um, the, the What we are told is, um, I think they're aware of the potential volume of cases that are headed their way. Um, so obviously, if they go into bankruptcy, then it allows them to try and duck out of, of dealing with those claims. Um, but as I say, it's been rejected twice. And the, the rumours are they may try again. Um, but at this point, they are active and solvent and will have to deal with uh, cases as they come forward. So because of the changing nature of the cases and the fact that we are slowly, very slowly, because as I said earlier, we're still having a, a huge um, influx of cases for, for gentlemen exposed in heavy industry, shipyards and power stations, etc. And um, because we are now getting these new wave of cases, we have to be um, alert and we have to be on our toes. Um, so in our, in our approach, which, which we, we, we roll out in every case, is at the outset to obtain uh, the best possible evidence is to go and visit the client at the home and sit down and discuss with them their, their exposure, if they're able to recall it, because it's difficult. We are talking about um, 20, 30, up to 40, 50 years ago, uh, which is not a, an easy task. However, the burden is on, on the pursuer to establish their case. So we will go through the work history. We'll, we'll consider where they, where they grew up, what their father or mother did for a living. Um, all of it comes into the picture of, of exposure. Um, we'll then obtain their employment history. And if we're able to identify an employer that they were exposed to asbestos whilst working for, then we'll look into them. Um, it can often be the case that because of the, the legacy nature of of the work, um, the employer can be insolvent out of business or perhaps has been bought over. It, all sorts of, 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 of developments could happen between the employment and now. Um, but if the employer is dissolved, it doesn't mean that we can't um, pursue the case. We've got ways of looking into the insurance history. So to see if we can find uh, an employer's liability insurance policy. Um, and the more recent the case, the, the more likely it is that you'll find a policy. Um, having employer's liability insurance became compulsory in 1972. So um, the further back you go beyond that and the smaller the employer, so if it was a one-man band or a, a, a partnership, it becomes a little bit more difficult and unlikely to either trace insurance or the individuals themselves. But the larger the organization, then the more likely it is you're going to be able to do that. So it's always worth looking into and, and certainly always hopefully um, being able to identify at least an insurer. Um, if we're able to, to identify a defender and progress the case, um, one of the steps that we'll always take, especially in cases involving mesothelioma or lung cancer, is to secure their evidence by way of affidavit. So we'll go back out, we'll sit down with them once we've got their evidence to the point that they are satisfied is, is as best as it will we'll get, then we'll have it locked in in an affidavit. And that secures that. Um, it's very, very often the case that there are no uh, colleagues or witnesses that we can call upon. Just through time, people will either lose touch or sadly, a lot of the former colleagues are, are deceased. So we can't rely on that. So the, the pursuer's evidence is essentially the the, the hub, it is the, the, the crux of, of the case. Um, however, there are situations, and I'll, I'll mention this in, in a few slides, um, where if there is an evidential shortfall, so for example, a family may approach us uh, and we don't have an opportunity to speak to the deceased to obtain their evidence, then we can refer back to a, a very significant bank of cases that we have pursued previously 
for other for other clients. And if we're able to marry up a, a particular employer within a time frame or location, then we can tap up other previous clients and say, would you be a witness? And quite often you'll find that they are happy to do that because they've been in that situation. The next step after we have secured all the liability evidence is to obtain the medical records and to get a medical report. And that is that's a hugely important element of the case um, because obviously the records will confirm what we know in terms of the diagnosis, but the report that the independent consultant will prepare um, will establish the extent of the injury, uh, the extent of the condition and how that is impacting on the individual, but also will comment on future risks of something more serious developing or perhaps uh, a worsening or deterioration of the condition that they have currently. And that's really important in terms of firstly how you you, you value the case, of course, but also as well um, the advice that you give to the, to the client uh, in one of the options that they have to, to decide upon later in the case. So um, that essentially it's all of our initial investigations. And then the next task we have to do is obviously pursue the case and establish negligence, which you will now go through. <clears throat> Thanks, Gary. Yes. Yeah. So um one of the so, some clients are quite um reticent about pursuing these cases. A lot of them are more kind of elderly gentlemen who have never been involved in a compensation claim, find the idea of it all pretty murky um, and don't want to become involved in it but one of the the concerns they have is nobody knew it was dangerous um nobody knew that it was asbestos was dangerous when i was working with it and while that may be the case for them if they left school at the age of 15 and were working as a joiner coming into contact with asbestos uh, they may not have known it was dangerous but um the only way we can win these cases and it comes back to delict um, and negligence is that it, we have to establish um, a foreseeable risk of injury. So we have to be able to persuade the court that um, the level of asbestos that they were being exposed to put the exposer, usually the employer, on notice that it posed um, a foreseeable risk of injury. So we, we will not win, and that's what we have to explain to the clients. And sometimes that, when we go through the process, I'll explain to you in the moment, once we've explained that people did know it was dangerous when they were being exposed, that will encourage them to, to proceed with these cases because it's uh, it's also annoys them um, because they thought it was safe. They didn't have a clue as a young boy, effectively, um, being exposed to other people did or should have known about it. Um, and we have to be very careful not to judge employers by the standards of today. We have to put ourselves back in the position of the employer in 1962, 1975, whenever. So we have to put ourselves back in time as to, to in order to find out what information was available to um, the uh, employer at that time. Um, so what we need to know about is the medical knowledge and what knowledge was there of the dangers of asbestos at that time. And it really goes back a long way. So dust has been on the radar for well over, I say, two centuries in terms of being dangerous, but in terms of asbestos itself being a dangerous substance to inhale, um, there's a few milestone dates, and one of them was this 1924, um, when there was an article in the BMJ about this lady who's pictured there, um, and she was a, a worker at Turner's Brothers Asbestos in Rochdale, so a huge asbestos factory, and her death was attributed to pulmonary asbestosis. So she was the first recorded um, death that was noted to be caused by inhaling asbestos fibres way back in 1924. Um, just by coincidence, it was the 100th anniversary of her death yesterday. Um, so the knowledge of the dangers has been known since that date. So as time has gone on, the knowledge of the dangers medically has become better understood, and then that has fed through to public knowledge, um, which I'll come on to in a moment. And it was after um, the, this was the government started noticing that there were more individuals working in these industries, developing pretty horrible lung conditions, that they commissioned this Merriweather and Price report, the job of which was to determine if they were able to make a link between asbestos exposure and these pretty nasty lung conditions, and they were. So the, the, the outcome of that report was that there was no doubt that working in environments of very heavy exposure to asbestos, inhaling those fibres, did result in very serious lung conditions. And as a result of that, the government enacted 
the asbestos industry regs in 1931. And now, yeah, it's incredible to think now, but that's exactly as it says, there was an asbestos industry. And it was a big industry, specifically in Glasgow, north of England, certain areas. It was a big industry. Um, and they fought really hard for a long time to hide the dangers of asbestos. And Gary alluded to it there. So I'll try to sponsor France and All Blacks. They were previously Cape Insulation. And if you Google it, there's a big campaign just now, Cape Must Pay, <laughs> because um, down in England, they were able to recover documents from Cape Insulation from the 1960s and 70s, confirming that they were um, hiding. They knew about the dangers of asbestos, but they were hiding it. Um, and we were providing the government with the misinformation in terms of the, the dangers of it. Um, so they are you know, on the hook for a lot of these cases, Cape insulation. Um, but the, the, the initial reaction on finding out it was dangerous was to try and control it a bit. So that the 31 regs didn't ban the use of asbestos, and it was just to limit the extent of exposure. Because at that stage, they didn't know, as we know now, there's no safe level. They thought, we just need to put a lid on it a little bit and we'll be okay. So ventilation, face masks, that sort of thing. So, but it was, they were trying to exclude extremely heavy exposure to asbestos um, at that point, because they weren't aware that lighter exposure was also dangerous. Um, but moving on, uh, things changed and people started to become aware of um, the dangers of the lower levels of asbestos. And one of the big dates for us um, in these types of cases is October, 1965. And that is when Sunday Times published an article um, highlighting the report by two doctors, Newhouse and Thompson, who linked for the first time uh, mesothelioma in women to um, the activity of shaking out their husband's asbestos-related overalls. So this was very different from the heavy exposure that you would see in asbestos factories or mining asbestos. This was a woman um, shaking off her husband. Her husband's come home from work, taking off his overalls. She's shaking it out, breathing in the dust, and they found a link between that so as far as we are concerned, in establishing negligence, um, 1965, October is a really crucial date for us. So our, the cases of low level ex exposure are easier for us to win after that because it was in the front page of the Sunday Times. And then it was picked up by other newspapers, um, such as you see the um, Evening Times talking about danger dust. And this was um, insulating engineers striking in 1967. Um, Glasgow Herald covering it as well. And so th that's what we've done over the years. We collated a huge bank of what we call knowledge documents. So we can, whatever our client's exposure to asbestos is, we can put ourselves in the middle of these documents and everything prior to that, we will say that is the information that was available to the employer to put them on notice that what they were doing is putting their, um, their employee at risk. And just the next page is, this is a, a kind of standard inventory of productions that we have in chronological order um, with documents highlighting the risks, the advice from the government, the factory inspectorate, newspaper articles, medical journals. Um, and I think it's a ever changing document. I think at the moment there's about 125 documents in that um, highlighting wh which have informed the reasonable employers to what they should or should not be doing in terms of exposure to asbestos. And the, the, the further on in time it gets, the harder is it for them to say we didn't know anything. The size of the company makes a difference. So if it's a huge company, say Shell or BP, it's quite hard for them not to, to be at the forefront of medical knowledge. Whereas if it, if it was a plumber, um, a sole trader in the late 1960s, he can maybe say, how would I have known about it? So the bigger the company, the easier for it is, is for us to pin knowledge on them. Um, so that's, that's a, a bit of a battleground. But I say at the moment, um, there's a bigger battleground which I'll come on to. Um, these types of cases are difficult, as Gary saying, huge investigations to be done in terms of who did the client work for, obtaining proof of employment, then finding, um, does the company still exist? And it's easy if someone's worked for a local authority, it's pretty easy, um, or the Ministry of Defence and a stock guard, it's quite easy. But a lot of them, it's historical insurance policies um, you're trying to find. And the majority of our clients now are their tradesmen. They are joiners, plumbers, electricians who've moved around jobs. And the task we have is to identify as many of the employers exposed them as possible. Because the, the rule is, um, as far as the, the liability of that employer, they're only liable for the proportion of harm they cause. So if you were responsible for 10% of exposure to asbestos as an employer, 
you pay 10% of the compensation. So we need to sue as many of the companies as we can. Often, we get very few of them. Um, so we may get a case where we've got 5% cover. Um, and if the case settles for £7,000, that's uh, £350 for the cover. But there's provisional damages, which protects your position, allows them to come back in the future, which makes it worthwhile they can come back from a claim in the future. So they don't always get um, the full amount. And these cases rumble on because you have numerous um, defenders, agents involved for each, often for the different employer, but then different insurers can have different uh, solicitors acting for them. So there's huge amounts of fighting their side of things to try and agree apportionment, as they would call it. So they tend to rumble on these cases. They're all, they're all litigated. Every one of these cases, um, they're all litigated. Um, because you don't resolve without that. Mesothelioma, though, is an exception to this apportionment, um, and it makes it slightly easier for mesothelioma victims, the nasty, really nasty cancer. Um, the Compensation Act 2006 means that we only need to sue one employer um, and we recover 100% of the compensation. So we don't need to go through the task of suing every employer. We can speed up the process, so it makes it a bit easier for us um, for those types of cases. It's not the same for lung cancer. It's a campaigning point that we're, we worked with asbestos charities that we want them to push on a bit because the lung cancer cases, there are deductions for untraced periods where we can't find insurance or we can't find an employer. Um, so it's something we want to, to think about. But for mesothelioma cases, I'll come on to the, the, the parliament and also the courts have really bent over backwards to make things easier for mesothelioma victims. And this is really highlighted in the, uh, the next slide where we talk about causation, so medical causation, um, which is what test is there in mesothelioma cases that allows us to establish that the exposure to asbestos caused the mesothelioma? <clears throat> and the difficulty in mesothelioma cases is that we cannot say that particular exposure to asbestos caused the mesothelioma. So the state of scientific knowledge is simply not there. So if we were subject to the normal but-for test in the way you'd be for a road traffic accident or a workplace accident, the but-for the accident, they would not have suffered the broken leg or whatever. We can't use that test. And if that was the test, they would not be successful cases. So in Fairchild, which is one of the most, probably the most famous asbestos disease case, the court bent the rules and modified the approach to causation for mesothelioma claims only. Um, and the test is that we need to show that the exposure to asbestos materially increased the risk of the individual developing mesothelioma. So um, it's a really, if they hadn't, as I said, if they had not bent the rules in that way, we wouldn't be successful with these cases. But the difficulty this is now causing us is that the, everybody, everybody in the UK or developed world has a risk of mesothelioma. Um, there's asbestos in the air everywhere. Everybody has asbestos in their lungs. So epidemiologists have looked at this and they know what the risk that the general member of the population has in the UK of developing mesothelioma. So we know what your risk is without any known exposure. What the defenders are trying to say is, OK, you need to prove how much your risk of, expo risk of mesothelioma has increased because of this exposure against my client, one of the employers. And what they're asking us to do is work out the cumulative exposure, then involve epidemiologists and statisticians to look at data and try and figure out to what extent the risk has increased. And is it a material increase? Because the court has the court's never defined what a material increase is. And what the defenders are saying is, you need to prove what the risk was without any known exposure, what the risk has become. And it's very, with, with the known exposure, and it's very difficult to do that at low level because there's not good data. So they're putting us in a really difficult position. And it's the biggest battleground at the moment, I see these low exposure cases where it's not heavy exposure to asbestos, it's very low exposure. And the defenders are sitting back, arms folded, saying, you prove that that exposure has materially increased the risk and it's really difficult for us to do. So we're thinking of ways to approach that, um, but it, it, it's really tricky. Um, so that, that's medical causation. I'll pass it back over to Gary, who I think is gonna talk about roughly the value of these cases and what, what, the, what the individuals tend to be awarded. So uh, of the, the list of conditions that were discussed earlier, I, I will, will cover a couple, just um, really to highlight a couple of major developments um, that we have been involved in um, and just for uh, a little bit more 
information to you generally about the, the fatal uh, work. So you touched upon it earlier about provisional damages, and that's something that we um, will pursue in every case, it, with the exception of mesothelioma and certain lung cancer cases, um, we can raise a court action for what is known as provisional damages and full and final damages. And the, the difference between both um, is really about how someone feels about the, the risk that they have of developing something more serious and if they want to protect their future interests. So with provisional damages, what they would receive are a sum of damages just now to um, address the condition that they presently have. However, what they would also obtain is an order from the court that basically says they can come back should that condition either worsen or they develop something more serious, such as mesothelioma or lung cancer, which uh, are usually terminal. So that uh, provisional damages does really protect their own future interests as well as their family. Um, alternatively, full and final, as it sounds, um, you take maximum uh, damages at this point for the condition which you have, um, but you would also receive an uplift, which is essentially buy off the, the rate for you to come back in the future. So as a matter of course, um, just because we are more cautious, we always recommend provisional damages. Um, and one other factor um, which leans into that advice is the issue of time bar. So in Scotland, the three-year rule uh, applies to all uh, personal injury cases, but with asbestos exposure, it's a little bit more, um, in, well, in our view, a bit unfair. So the way that it operates with asbestos exposure is that you get three years from the date that you first become aware that you have an asbestos condition. And if, say for example, that's plural plaques, um, you get three years to pursue that case. Now, if you don't pursue it within that three year period, then that right becomes time barred. And unfortunately, um, you may go on to develop mesothelioma or asbestosis or lung cancer. Um, and the way that the uh, operation of time bar uh, takes effect here is that any subsequent claim would also be time barred as well. And then the knock-on effect of that is if that condition which you develop laterally uh, is fatal, your family would have claims under the Damages Scotland Act and their cases would be uh, in theory time barred as well. So it's a quite severe knock-on effect if you fail to pursue and hopefully then secure your future rights through provisional damages at the outset. So it's a really important factor um, in these cases. And, and as a starting point, we'll get our medical report, as I mentioned earlier, we'll understand what the risks are in terms of the percentages of one of those conditions developing, explain that to the client, and then give them their advice. Now, of course, at the end of the day, it's their decision um, to make which way they want to go. Um, but certainly, uh, we do prefer to, to recommend provisional damages just to, to give them that protection for the future. Um, however, for a lot of years, um, Plural plaques um, and, and, and quanti quantification of what a plural plaques case is worth was quite quite difficult. Um, so the 2009 Act, which came in, which said that plural plaques are, are an injury which is compensatable, um, resulted in a tidal wave of plural plaques cases, which were all um, assisted in the court of session to then come forward. Uh, and then it became uh, quite a difficult um, battleground with insurers uh, because we kept trying to run um, cases to court Try to run proofs to to get uh, judicial guidance on what uh, well how to how to approach evaluation of, of a plaques case, and the shearers kept buying off the risk and kept chucking money at it. However, um, fortunately for us, the Advocate General doesn't really care or take a pragmatic view on things like that. So they decided to run these two cases. Um, both um, pursuers were my clients. So the first day of WW, I met Mr. Wales back in two thousand and fourteen. If you had uh, plural plaques due to exposure whilst working for the Ministry of Defence in the Recife dockyard, um, there was no real um, challenge on liability. Um, however, we then had to establish what the appropriate range of awards were in a provisional damages settlement. And at the time, this was a landmark judgment. Um, and to my knowledge, there's been no further judgments on provisional damages in plural plaques cases. Uh, and the court held that a range of about 5,500 to 9,000 was an appropriate uh, range of awards for provisional damages. Now that adjusted for inflation is about 8,000 to 13,000, so it's not insignificant. And again, um, it is something that we still refer to in all of our 
cases. And I think it's very helpful to have a sliding scale because, in fairness, um, not every pursuer that we meet is very, very anxious about plaque's diagnosis. They, they quite often are, which is why they're going for provisional damages. However, some people will be more anxious than others, and there has to be a scale to try and reflect that. So we were able to get um, some judicial guidance on provisional. And then the following year, um, my client, Mr. Harris, we ran his proof. Um, however, he wanted to pursue full and final damages. And because um, it was quite difficult to, to provide advice as to how um, that should be calculated, we developed a methodology for that, um, which we're very pleased to say was adopted by the court. The defender, again, the Advocate General, um, very helpfully running these cases so that we can build up a body of jurisprudence. Um, they simply suggested the approach of a finger in the ear, lump sum award to add on top of the provisional damages, whereas we suggested a methodology which essentially involves taking the risks that are discussed in the medical report, apply those to the, the value of a mesothelioma case, taking a percentage of that using um, the midpoint of life expectancy of the individual um, and then using the multiplier and opting to then calculate what that would be. So it's a fairly complicated calculation, um, but it's it's the the best and reasoned approach that we um, have. And it, again, it's still used in every single plaques case to this day. In terms of fatals, um, I will touch upon just very briefly in life and in death. Um, in life, um, when it comes to, to meso and lung cancer cases, two biggest heads of claim that we will pursue for is first and foremost pain and suffering. And for uh, mesothelioma cases, I think that can range from about 63,000 to 114. And then for lung cancer, um, it can range from about 70 to 97. Um, it, it depends on the severity and the duration of the symptoms. Um, mesothelioma is generally a, a, a more uh, aggressive and uh, painful condition to live live with. Um, so that is why the band of awards are slightly higher. Um, but the next big head of claim after that is what's called lost years. And that is essentially that period of lost life expectancy um, and the income that an individual should have received through private pension, state pension, and any other gainful activity that they were involved with. Um, and we would ask for that now subject to a 25% discount, but we would ask for payment of that now. And then on top of that, there are services. Naturally, when people develop these types of conditions, families will gather, they'll, they'll all pull in, and it will be all hands on deck to help out the individual. Um, and that should be acknowledged and addressed in these claims. And then separate to that as well is care costs. So if time permitting, we're able to get a, a care report and get a care package put in place for the individual that can um, take a lot of stress off of them and their family in their last months. However, it's a very costly uh, exercise. The, the, the it's commercial rates that are used there, so defenders do not like those reports, but it's appropriate in these cases that we do whatever we can to assist um, our clients in their last, in their last months. Um, now, if the situation arises where, say for instance, they don't survive to see the conclusion of the case, or or they do. Um, with mesothelioma, um, it is it's irrelevant in terms of the rights of the family to pursue cases. So with mesothelioma only, and it doesn't apply to lung cancer, there's an exception within the Damages Scotland Act that allows for family members to pursue claims uh, at the point of the death of their loved one. And in terms of the Act, it's very helpfully quite wide reaching in terms of who can claim. So first and foremost, the spouse, or partner of the deceased, um, their siblings and uh, children and grandchildren. And what's helpful about the 2011 Act and the way it's structured is it says basically that these relationships are about the quality of the relationship. And I've highlighted the, the Brenda Gray cases again because this was in completing the trilogy with the Advocate General um, around the same time as the other two cases. We um, sought damages for two um, adults um, who we argued that the deceased accepted as his children. And the Advocate General wanted to argue that a child should be defined uh, as it is generally as someone under the age of 16 in Scotland, etc. Um, 
we were successful in saying no it's about the quality of the relationship and um, because you'll always be someone's child regardless even if in this situation where the deceased married uh, mrs gray later in life by the time she already had children in their late 20s early 30s and then lived as essentially as their father for 20 years plus so the, they suffered a loss because they lost that father figure in their life and then in terms of the in terms of the loss that and how the, the, the legislation phrases it we focus on 43A and 43B. Very quickly, uh, 43A is loss of support. So that is um, a financial dependent, typically uh, a widow um, who has lost income to the house. Now this head of claim um, will trigger if we're not able to settle the live case in life. And that lost years claim that I mentioned earlier essentially transfers over to her and becomes her claim for loss of support because it is a huge loss of income into the household. And sometimes what we'll find is in cases there might not be a, a partner or a spouse that will survive the deceased. And unfortunately, if we're not able to settle it in lifetime, that claim falls away. So um, we always will try and pursue these cases as fast as humanly possible, um, but even, even more so still um, if we think that that huge significant head of claim is just simply going to disappear upon their death. And finally, just to give you a rough idea, 43B tries to address the, the loss of society, which is the old fashioned term for the loss of a loved one, the support, the guidance, the, the relationship, everything that, that comes along with, with losing a loved one. Um, the court has had a very difficult task of trying to put figures on that loss. Um, and without going through every case, I've given a rough, just a rough, a rough, uh, broad range of awards for the widow, um, children and uh, the grandchildren and siblings. So um, they're not in any way insignificant and quite often we'll go to uh, conferences in England, we'll, we'll um, attend different events and we can pursue these cases, whereas in England they cannot pursue the the extent of the family cases that, that we can. They're, they're fixed to a, a lump sum fixed by statute of about £16,000 for um people falling into certain categories and they have to share that whereas here in Scotland each individual listed there is entitled to a sum to themselves independent and distinct from everyone else so if you know we, we often encourage them if they have a client and, and there's Scottish exposure and we can establish jurisdiction then to pass that case up and we can get far more up here for, for the family of the deceased um, they can down there so on that Point, I thought it'd be helpful just to highlight um, a couple of cases um, where we've been able to take on a case referred over to Digby Brown um, and, um, well, essentially the benefit of a previous um, experience and involvement in these cases and what we've been able to assist the family with. So I just highlighted this case study. Firstly, um, this um, lady, I'll call her Mrs B, um, she was referred to herself from a firm in, in air and she was passed over to us because on the death certificate it said lung cancer and there was also little plaques noted. Um, I spoke to her, um, her husband sadly um, had died only a few months prior and obviously could not have access to his evidence so it was a case of trying to then build a picture. And we got his employment history, um, we looked through that, and there were some shipyards, certainly, that we've sued on many, many occasions. I was then able to delve into the archives of, of previous witnesses and previous cases that were pursued against the shipyards and use those individuals and their evidence to then essentially bridge the gap of what he would have been doing and how likely it is that what he was doing would have put him into proximity of disturbed asbestos and then we used that in combination with expert uh, engineering evidence which then allowed us to establish that he would have been exposed to a significant quantity of asbestos so much so that we could establish the link between the lung cancer and the exposure which as you mentioned earlier is often quite a difficult thing to do and because we were able to establish that then it opened up cases for the family. So we were then able to pursue cases for his entire family, and as opposed to the case being worth two to three thousand pounds for posthumous plural plaques only, in total we were able to get about 185,000 for the family. So Mrs B was quite rightly referred on to ourselves. Um, we were able to 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 use the bank or, or evidence that we've got and thankfully we're able to get her family uh, a, a really good result uh, in the absence of having the deceased's evidence, which is usually a, a real uphill struggle.
So I'll pass you on to you for the last one. Um, yeah, I think we're nearly there. The bell has gone, but um, I'll, I'll whisk through this case study. So this is a case that was passed to me by a, a network member, an individual with mesothelioma. Kind of unusual um, exposure, but we do see a few of these cases. Uh, working in a garage in the 19, early 1970s, um, and the brake pads uh, were made with asbestos, chrysotile um, asbestos. And as brake pads do, they wear down over time. And at that time, there were brake drums um, that the pads were inside. So the dust that was left <coughs> uh, after the, the use of the pads over time um, gathered in the brake drums. And what the mechanics used to do was use an air hose, an air line, that they would normally use to blow the tires up, but they'd use that to clear out the dust. So that dust would be blown into the individual's face, contain asbestos, um, and develop mesothelioma. Quite tricky cases because there's a there's scientific arguments that at very high heat, <clears throat> asbestos turns into something else and that is not dangerous, but we obtained engineering evidence um, confirming that um, there's still a significant proportion of asbestos fibres, um, and we were successful for that. Uh, that family with uh, a total settlement for the estate, for the widow, for the uh, siblings and children um, in the region of £450,000. And it's it's always bittersweet to the family in these cases. There's a huge injection of money um, in the kind of worst uh, circumstances, and they all react very differently to it. Um, but it's a huge injection. And usually, the, the, as it tends to be, the, the man that started the case, knowing he won't benefit from it, but he's leaving some sort of legacy um, for his family, some some good has come out of a terrible situation, and we do the, the cases that as we've had, I think two cases over settled for over a million pounds for an individual, and uh, they're certainly younger people, so they, they range hugely in award these cases from low six figures up to um, just over seven figures. So they're they're really important cases for us to pursue, um, and hugely worthwhile for the families to to become involved in. Most of them are very, very happy with the outcome. Um, so I will pass you back to Rosalie, who I think will tie things up for us. But um, thanks, everybody, for staying distance. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. That was a really insightful presentation. And just an hour is just simply not enough. There is so much more detail. I know you could both go into there. Um, we will quickly have some time for a little bit of questions. If anyone does have one, feel free to pop them into the chat box now. But I will pass you over to Emma, who has been watching that. So Emma, over to you. Thank you, Rosie. So I have a question here, and um, that is, do you think they are getting further forward with medical treatment for asbestos-related conditions in Scotland? Um, there was well, a recent breakthrough. I think that um, with mesothelioma treatment, um, which proved to prolong the the life of the sufferer, um, I don't think I don't think we're any closer to a cure, um, but uh, certainly there does seem to be advancements in how mesothelioma is is managed. But again, that it depends on the individual and how fit they are and when it's diagnosed, um, because Fortunately, we might see someone who is um, it's it's fairly fairly um, progressed and advanced, and they might not be fit enough to undergo chemotherapy, immunotherapy. Um, so it just it's a case by case basis. But there are there are breakthroughs. Um, there was one reported by the Guardian a couple of weeks ago, which proved to be very optimistic. Yeah. So I think that the difficulty is so this is only for the so lung cancer is treated as any other lung cancer. So the tr same treatments for that mesothelioma. The main break through has been um, immunotherapy, but it, it's it's lengthening lives by months um, mm -hmm. is the, the most that it's doing. So they're in a kind of difficult position. There's no, pleural plaques don't cause any symptoms. You can't, once someone has pleural plaques, you can't then change. There's nothing you can do to prevent something more severe happening. You can't give any, that's, clients sometimes wonder if they're diagnosed with pleural plaques, what can I do to stop anything more severe? There's nothing. Um, and it's really just managing the condition, as Gary saying, is the main thing with the asbestosis, the breathing problems, it's managing it. Um, so I don't think it's, there's no no big breakthrough. They tried surgery. There's a recent trial, Mars 2 um, trial, that did try with mesothelium, but the outcomes we, some of our clients went through it, and it was, the outcomes are pretty dreadful. Mm -hmm. And really horrible, horrible things happen to them. So they, they don't do that anymore. It's purely um, they treat the symptoms and, and try and slow it a bit. Yeah. 
Thank you both for answering um, today. I'll pass back to Rosie to bring our session to a close. Thank you all for that. I um, appreciate everyone this um, time. I've just ran over it ever so slightly, but thank you everyone for questions and getting in touch with us today. Um, just some final words from me before we wrap up. Um, thanks to everyone for joining today. Our registration is open for the rest of our April to June diet. So if you haven't already, look out for more of information on that coming. Um, hope everyone has a good weekend when it comes. I will just pass back to you and Gary to say their final words, but it's a thank you from me. Yeah, no, thanks everybody for attending. And if you have any questions or queries about any um, asbestos related uh, cases or anything that's come out of this later on, please get in touch with Gary um, or myself and we, we can hopefully answer them. But um, no, I appreciate you all giving up um, just over an hour of your time. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. No, thank you. That's been brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll speak to you all later. Thank you.